The Retirement Cafe podcast, why the rich go broke with John McGregor. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast with me, your host, Justin King. If you're thinking about your retirement or already retired, you're in the right place. My aim is to help you plan for and live a successful and meaningful retirement. Retirement is far more than just a financial event. It's a significant life event, a major transition, which will bring with it new challenges and opportunities. So each episode contains tips, information and inspiration to help you feel more informed and confident about your retirement. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining me for another episode of my podcast. For the whole of June, the podcast is brought to you by The Joy Club. If you're looking for a more joyful retirement, The Joy Club is for you. The Joy Club is a membership website that enables members to enjoy a more active, connected and joyful retirement. There's something new for members to enjoy every weekday with their exclusive online member events. Members get access to art classes, mindful and relaxing Tai Chi and Qigong sessions, a monthly book club, expert talks from healthcare professionals, filmmakers, historians, plus regular Zumba, ballroom and yoga classes, creative writing and more. As a member, you can activate great discounts on food and drink, eco-friendly products, family days out, tours, and much, much more. You can discover money-making and volunteering opportunities. You can access the community via the Joy Clubbers Facebook group and enjoy inspiring content delivered weekly to your inbox. Join today for free or upgrade to premium membership for just £5 a month and unlock unlimited access to the Joy Club's online member events. Listeners to this podcast can enjoy three months of premium membership absolutely free by using the promo code RETIRECAFE21. You don't need to enter your credit card details, there's no obligation to upgrade and you can cancel any time. Simply go to www.thejoyclub.com, click sign up and enter the promo code when prompted. This offer is redeemable until the 31st of August 2021. To find out more about The Joy Club, take a listen to episode 123 with The Joy Club's founder, Hannah Thompson, which was released just a month ago. Now, on to this week's guest. This week, I am delighted to be joined by John McGregor. John is an author and financial advisor over in the United States. Like me, he's passionate about improving people's lives, not just their finances. After many years climbing the corporate ladder, John set out to transform the world's relationship with money. In one of his books, The Top 10 Reasons the Rich Go Broke, John shares stories of wealthy people who lost their fortunes. He explores the mistakes they made and sets out ways that we can avoid making the same mistakes. In our conversation, John shares the story of how his grandparents' outlook on money influenced him immensely. His take on society's approach to money today and what he calls the financial epidemic. And steps we can all take to better understand our money behavior and be financially more successful. So, without further ado, here's my conversation with John McGregor. So, welcome to the Retirement Cafe podcast, John McGregor. Great to be here, Justin. Really love the work you're doing. It's really, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I was, uh, I was just saying that. Um, uh, well, I was saying to Kathy, my wife, the other week, um, we've got to get this guy. I've just read his book. Um, got to get the, the 
the, I've just read this book. Um, some of some listeners may know I've just done a, a talk to our local school. Um, and one of the influences was your book, The Top 10 Reasons the Rich Go Broke. And I was like, oh, I've got to get this. This John would be really interesting to talk to. Anyway, for John, for people who don't know you, because <laughs> I'm sounding like very much like a fanboy here, but for people who don't know you, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and, and the great work that you do? I just have to say, it's funny to hear you say my book. It defy it would defy all my English teachers, the fact that I wrote a book. Um, <laughs> I think that was part of my motivation was to defy them. And uh, anyway, um, it's great to be on the show with you again. <clears throat> I've been in the financial industry for, gosh, going on 20, almost 27 years now. And I think I've circled the globe in the financial industry. I, I was a financial advisor and grew a big practice. And then I was the manager for the complex and then I wanted to climb the corporate uh, the, the corporate ladder and and um, went into corporate and went into institutional management for a large money management firm. Um, then I was a national retirement director and a national sales director. And and I think the higher I climbed the corporate ladder, the more miserable I got. And um, and that's when I left and uh, you know walked walked away from from you know a, a nice salary to really pursue my dream which is transforming the world's relationship with money. And excuse me, my glasses here. And that's what my book is really about, is, is really getting to the mistakes that people make that, and it's about, yeah, my book's alluring stories of the wealthy and these people that had it all um, and why they went broke. But it's really about why most people go broke or why most people are living paycheck to paycheck and can't get out of the rat race and are just struggling nonstop. So um, uh, the last thing I'll say, and I'll stop, um, learning from people's, the, the overarching theme is learning from people's successes is smart, but we think learning from people's mistakes is genius. And that's what my book is about, really understanding the mistakes people make and, and how to avoid those mistakes. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let's dig, let's dig a bit more into that. So, um, one of the, well, one of the guiding principles, um, obviously I want to touch on the mistakes, but I feel that there was a big influence with your um, grandparents in the book. Uh, and this, this is kind of, you know, if we go back to your backstory of, of, of how you learned about money and then maybe, maybe you've made some mistakes along the way you, um, before you started to kind of go to the world, look, actually, I can help you with this. Tell me, tell me, let's just go back a little bit and, and tell me this relationship with your grandparents and, and how that's kind of, evolve your thinking. Absolutely. And thanks for asking, Justin. So yeah, I, I had amazing influences in my life, my grandparents and certainly my own parents. And I learned about money early on when, you know, as, as long as I can remember every Christmas, my grandparents would give us some shares of stock um, in dividend paying stocks that we would use for our, ultimately for our college um, to, uh, expenses. And so we've been accumulating these shares of stock over time and they'd pay dividends. So every quarter I'd get $10 or something wow. like that. And I'd be following these stocks. One was a bank, one was a railroad um, that ultimately I still have today. I use some of it for college, but a lot of it was absorbed. In fact, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway bought two of the companies um, that I own. So I, I've sort of been involved in the stock market ever since. But but where I think I really got grounded with money is, is in the summers. I grew up in Hawaii and my grandparents were in Minnesota and, and, and they had a pretty sizable farm that I would go and work. And, and that's where I would earn my money for the year. So I'd go to Minnesota for a couple months during the summer. And it was amazing to see my grandparents, how closely they monitored every nickel, every penny they spent. They grew up in the depression and um, really weathered that in, in very, very difficult times. But given their savings and how meticulous and methodical they were about their money really influenced me. I can remember every afternoon looking at my grandfather in his study, um, he had a big ledger and every single penny was accounted for. And my grandmother was well aware of all the money as well. So it was a team approach to managing their finances. And my grandfather, you know, he was a vice president at, at a bank he retired from. And he never, I don't think he made, I can't remember what I said. I don't think he made more than $25,000 a year 
um, back in those days, which I guess was a, was a nice salary back then, but in today's standards, not, not, not so much. And, and they were able to retire very comfortably, travel the world. They went on cruises on a regular basis. They'd come to visit us in Hawaii on a regular basis. And then they left a sizable estate uh, to their children, my, my parents. And, and so it's, it's an amazing story, sort of the um, millionaire next door story, if you know, and um, how, how just living modestly, but very happily and, uh, and still being able to enjoy their retirement years. It's a great story that really influenced my life. And thank you for asking. Yeah. So it was, I mean, what did you, that, so that's, I mean, you've learned the, you know, you've just kind of labor, I suppose, on the farm, you know, and so farming, yes. I think farming directly connects you with, with, um, with planting seed and grows and, you know, actually return on capital and, 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 you know, and then what a genius idea to give, to give stocks as a, as a, as a gift. Absolutely. And, um, you know, they'd all obviously send us other gifts, but that was always something we always look forward to is, is getting those shares of stock and then following them in the newspaper, right? We didn't have computers at that time, but following them in the newspaper and seeing how they're doing and, and, uh, and, and monitoring those long way and then getting those dividends, which was great, which by the way, yeah. we couldn't touch. Uh, we weren't allowed to, but it was nice knowing we'd see 10 bucks or $8 or whatever it was on a quarterly basis. It was, it was great. Um, and then just the other stories of seeing my, my grandmother in the kitchen, you know, nothing was ever wasted. They didn't have a garbage disposal because no food was ever wasted. I could remember her pulling the, the breadcrumbs from the toaster, thinking she was going to throw them away, but she put them in a little plastic bag and I, I couldn't believe it. And, and, and they were used later on. Nothing was ever wasted in our house, in, in their house. And uh, so it sticks with me today. And there are other stories, uh, just going to restaurants and stuff. But um, yeah, tremendous influence. I love that story. I told it to my daughter, who uh, well, two daughters, uh, who's 11. And I told her, I told her the breadcrumbs story. Oh, she's, yeah, yeah. Like looking, she's looking at me like, what? <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. So, I mean, obviously, the world has shifted a lot from that generation. I mean, you know, um, we're seeing, well, obviously, we're I mean, uh, we're recording this on the 3rd of March. Obviously, it's going a week's time. But, we you know, both, both both all the world is still gr gripped by this pandemic. Um, and, you know, the relationship with money is going to be, for, for, for a large amount of the population of the world, is going to be tougher the next uh next the oncoming months and years i would i would presume anyway um what 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 are your what are your views and thoughts on, yeah. on where we're at and and what people could you know what people can do yeah i mean i think the paradigm has shifted justin um and it's gotten even worse because of covid but i think we're headed down this path anyway it's just covid has has accelerated it like I said, the paradigm shift, we could no longer operate as we once did 20 or 30 or even 10 years ago. You know, in the past, you know, you, you go to go to work, get a job, you work there for 30 years, you had job security, you get your pension and you retire, you know, retire happily as you as you envision. Those days no longer exist. Um, here in the U.S., we have Social Security, which is our government funded retirement plan. That's due to be bankrupt in 2035. Wow. Actually, estimates now say 2034. They've pulled it back a year. So what is that? 13 years from now, our Social Security, our government-run uh, retirement fund is bankrupt. And that's not just in the U.S. In my travels around the world, I'm seeing that all over the place. Then you have the private pensions, the corporate pensions. Those used to be secure. Now you're seeing these private pensions, these uh, you know, even the teachers' pensions and the police pensions and so forth, those are severely underfunded and getting worse because of the promises that they made. They, they, they just can't keep up with these promises. And now we're seeing these pensions being contested in courts. And as a result, we're seeing people's pensions being cut by considerable amounts, 30 to 50%. Here's somebody that's worked their entire life for a company slaving away as a, 
as an oil worker or a teacher or what have you, thinking they're going to get this nice pension in the end, 80% of their, re- of their last ret- uh, salary. And now they're saying, I'm sorry, we can't afford it. And they said, well, you promised it to me. And yeah, they did. But if there's no money, there's no money. So you have government running, running, uh, running funds that are depleted. You have private pensions that are severely underfunded and getting even more severely underfunded. And then the last one is personal savings. Here in the U.S., 64% of people could not come up with $500 for an emergency expense. Wow. 65% could not come up with $500 for an emergency excess, uh, emergency expense. I mean, that's just, that's unbelievable. So people don't, haven't saved very much. When I started my my books that I've written five years ago, 73% of the people were living paycheck to paycheck. Today it's 78%. And that's pre-COVID. So I can't even I can't even imagine what it is now. 78% pre-COVID are living paycheck to paycheck. I mean, this is a financial epidemic that's greater than all diseases combined. And I know that sounds like a pretty harsh. Uh, maybe a bloviated statement, but we can get into that. Why I say that, but this is a this is an epidemic that this world is facing. Yeah, yeah. So you know, knowing knowing all of that, and there's nothing there that I. I mean, obviously, you know your, the, the U.S. figures, and I would say that uh, the U.K. is probably not, not a not a massively dissimilar situation um, yeah. and countries of the world. So knowing knowing all of that. What is it that people can do? Yeah, there's a lot of things people can do. I mean, this this idea of just hoping everything is going to work out is not a strategy, right? I mean, we've seen that. You've seen that with your clients. I've seen that with my clients. Financial education is the key. You've got to get involved and you cannot expect someone else to take care of you. You cannot ex- expect the government to take care of you. You cannot ex- expect your private pension to take care of you. You have to be responsible for yourself. You have to consider yourself your own entity, your own corporation that has to survive. So just getting educated is is absolutely critical. I think that's the first step. Then there are other things. Um, One thing that I see often with my clients coming to me, and you probably experience this as well, is when they come to me, they come to me with a junk drawer of financial products and contracts and statements Half the time, most of the information is even missing. So people are completely financially disorganized. And I've seen a direct correlation between financial disorganization and financial devastation. So just getting your finances in order is extremely important. Then the other thing I would be doing, and this is a collaborative approach with your spouse or your partner or your loved ones, it cannot be done in isolation, is to really look and monitor the expenses that you're going through. Look at all of the expenses that you have on a regular basis, your needs versus your wants versus your savings, and really kind of de- determine, um, are those expen- uh, expenditures, uh, are they necessary? Do you have to have them? Or are there ways to have the same expense, but at a lower price? So I think I think um, expense monitoring is extremely critical, and most people just don't do it, sadly. So no. those are a couple of things for sure. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the, of course, you know, there's, there's a couple of aspects in motivation with everything that we do, I suppose, the human beings are motivated, you know, to, to make life better for themselves. Um, yeah. They're also motivated events, you know, it, there's fear is motivation as well. You know, I don't want to yeah. end up being destitute, but so, you know, monitoring your expenses and being financially organized, you know, it just sounds like, common sense <laughs> now, yeah. now now of course you know that's a bit of an oxymoron in itself isn't it if it's common then why is not everyone doing it um so what is the what how can we get people to really engage with this yeah. stuff maybe i suppose you've got to you know you your your grandparents story obviously was really quite formative in your mm-hmm kind of a thought process look you know actually they, 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 these people are these people are important in my life I, I can see how they operate and see the benefit of operating in that way so you took those skills on but but, but if these aren't if these skills aren't common how do we get people to really engage with those things because this is not about clever investment strategies or or um uh, you know this is just about some organization and then some also some understanding 
No, great question, Justin. And you just hit it on the head. Look, we all know what we need to do with our money for the most part, right? But we don't do it. We all know we need to eat better and, and exercise. Yet most people in the States are considered obese. 65% of the people in the States are obese, yet we all know we need to exercise and eat better, but we don't do it. We all know we need to manage our finances much better, but we don't do it. This isn't an information issue. We have all the information we need at our fingertips for free. Just Google, how do I manage my money? And you'll have all the, the free information you need. So this isn't an information issue. This is a behavioral issue. That's, that's the missing piece. I think that's what, that's what the financial industry misses. That's what financial education misses. It's a behavioral issue. And the only way to change behavior is at the core of your mindset, your mental programming at the subconscious. And our subconscious controls 95% of how we think, how we act, how we behave, and ultimately who we become. So in order to change your subconscious, you have to drill deep and get into the core of your mental programming in order to do that. That's what we designed. I we have a program called Thrive Path. It's five mm. elements that we take people through. It's really a, a journey of discovery that we take people through. So in the end, they have a much better relationship with money. And what that means is they're no longer using money to dull their pain. They're using money to fulfill their purpose. That's what Thrive Path was built to do. And I have a, my, my partner that we developed this with is a thought leader in the field of neuroscience. And so what we've done is we basically combine neuroscience and practical financial guidance into one process that we, that we take, take people through. There's a, there's a concept um, that we talk a lot about is, is above the line and below the line. And most people are living below the line. What I mean by that is above the line is when you're focused on your vision, your mission, and your goals, those kind of things. You know, the, the vision for your future, what's your mission in life and your purpose? And then what are the goals and how are you going to get there? Sadly, in, in what I've seen throughout the many years and certainly traveling and speaking is that most people are focused below the line. They want that quick fix. They want to know that investment strategy. Should I buy Apple stock? Should I get into Bitcoin? Should I get into multi-level marketing? Should I buy real estate? Um, should I day trade? And then they run off and they buy these expensive training programs and then they just lose interest in it or it doesn't work for them. And then six months later, they're back, John, I, you know, that didn't work, but should I go back to this other thing? They're looking for that quick fix below the line. And sadly, 90% of people's time is spent below the line. Whereas if you look at the most successful people in our, in, in our time or in, our, in, in, in the world, their focus, their success has always been because they're focused above the line. Below the line is secondary. That will always come, but you have to get your above the line sorted out first. That's where your mindset is programmed and laser focused on what your mission is, what's deeply meaningful to you at your core. Once you do that, then clarity starts to, to emerge. You're aware of what your circumstances are and how you're living your life is never going to get you what you want. That's when you go, oh my goodness, now I see it. Now I understand the importance of this. That's where the motivation comes in and the grit kicks in and the commitment to make those changes to become financially free. Everyone has this in them right now, right now. They just need to take some time and really dig deep in what, into what's deeply meaningful to them at the core and then realize that what they're doing, how they're living their life, who they're spending time with, where they're spending their money is not going to get them what's deeply meaningful to them. And most people haven't made that connection. So I can go on and on on this, Justin, but it was a great question. I, 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 I cannot stress enough. This is about mindset first before you start looking into those other things. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, um, we run a similar program called the retirement success program, and it is all about what would be a meaningful retirement. Um, and and, and it, it, you can apply this process any stage of your life. It's just that we, we work specifically with retirees, but uh, I kind of give it the analogy of, um, as you were saying, we know, we all know we should be, fit and eat the right food and you know it'll it'll be a salad for lunch not not a cake and a and a, and a, and a, and a bagel um right though once we've become 
once we've become once we become focused on okay so what is it i really want to be well i really want to be fit and let's say why 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 do we want to be fit let's say well you know i've got um i'm 51 and i've got uh, an 11 year old and a 9 year old and let's say that at some future point i have grandchildren so first of all i want to be fit for my children's life you know yet last night i was bouncing up and down on the trampoline with them now yeah you know, now I, I think to myself at 51, I don't think my dad was doing that with me. He really wasn't. When he was 51, there was no way. I mean, you know, he wasn't, a, he was, you know, he was, a, he was a manual. We ran an engineering company and, you know, we, we, we tended a couple of acres of, 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 of land, et cetera. So, you know, we, 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 we did some physical work and he did as well, but I still don't believe he would have been bouncing and doing tumbles on the trampoline, but, if I think about well, what is it I want to be, well, I want to be fit through my life, I want to be healthy. Um, and then, and then, of course, if, okay, so what will that allow me to do? Will it allow me to have fun with the kids and do expeditions and travel and climb mountains and whatever, whatever I uh, go sailing? What are the things that I enjoy and also hopefully enjoy through my retirement? But, and then maybe there'll be grandchildren. It'd be really lovely, wouldn't it? If, a, I don't know, a, 80, I could pick them up <laughs> and, 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 and play with them and, and maybe not jump up and down on a trampoline, but still be doing stuff with them. So therefore, what's the strategy, which I think is what you're saying about being below the line, what would be the strategy to be that fit 75, 80 year old? Well, the strategy would be eating well, um, exercising. Um, we know that as you get older, you get muscle wastage. So keep building body strength. Um, and 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 maintaining that throughout throughout my life, and that would be the strategy. That would be the tactic, wouldn't it? That would be the the program to buy. You know, maybe it is six months of being in the gym with a trainer, and maybe it's six months then learning to windsurf or something. But those would be the strategies. But the end goal is that fulfillment and that. And who do I want to be? Which, of course, has been been physically fit throughout my life, or as much as you hope can hope to be i mean you know you could have a genetic problem of course but you know actually the things that i'm in control of uh, that it, it's strategy below the line and actually the results and the meaningful life is above the top so if i flip that into what you're saying about money it's well what would be meaningful to you in your life what would be a really great achievement what would you you know if you were turning around at 85 and going you know wow what a retirement that was um it won't be about the strategy will it <laughs> The strategy comes, doesn't it? I think. I think that's what you're saying. The strategy just comes. It 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 starts to make sense once you understand what your meaning, what the a meaningful life is to you. You could have said it better, Justin. I mean, that was well said, and um, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I mean, just listening to you talk, we could we could take you and your motivation to be with your grandkids and your kids until you're 85 and be able to take them on a vacation, obviously, or, or you know, do those fun things with them in, in your elder days, because that's extremely meaningful to you. I mean, that's probably one of the most important things you ever want for yourself and for your family and your wife and so forth. And in that case, because that's so meaningful to you at the core of who, who Justin King is, we could put you in any industry, whether it's financial planning or real estate or anything, and you're going to succeed in order to achieve those things because that's extremely meaningful to you. And so the point is, is that once you understand what's deeply meaningful to you at that high level and you just realize, oh my gosh, that's what I'm here on this earth for. That's what my purpose is. No matter what you touch, you're going to succeed at it. The problem is, as I said earlier, most people aren't thinking there. Um, they're thinking below the line at the strategies and the tactics. But like you said, once you have that meaning and you know it, you are absolutely committed to it, anything below the line is going to work for you. I mean, I, I use this example of a, uh, a grandmother and her grandchild was the most important thing to her in the world. I mean, I, I, you, you see grandparents that love their grandchildren. I mean, this was on steroids, right? And the sad part, though, was she was a heavy smoker. <clears throat> and the daughter, her daughter said, um, Mom, you are no longer allowed to see your grandchild if you're smoking. Wow. I don't even, I don't, and she said, I don't care. And what I mean is, even if you're smoking elsewhere, 
I don't, if you are, if you are a smoker, period, you are no longer allowed to see your grandchild. Well, you know what happened, Justin? She quit like that Mm -hmm. and she's never touched a cigarette since. So the point is, is that when you uncover at a deep level, what's meaningful to you at your core, it is an absolute game changer and it will completely change your mindset and your motivation um, and your and your direction in life. It'll give you those guardrails, those 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 uh, that pathway that you're always looking for, mm-hmm. which in our case is financial freedom and, and peace of mind. So and that's what we take people through in our process. So, so John. Um- What's meaningful to you? Yeah, for me, it's a great question. Um, and it's it, it came from a story, actually, the first story in my book when I was landscaping, which is a fancy term for mowing yards and pulling weeds um, <laughs> during college um, for an old friend of mine who's still landscaping today. He's probably in his mid 60s and landscaper, happy as a clam, you know, doing what's meaningful to him. He's in the outdoors. He's made money. Anyway, that's another story. But I was uh, landscaping at my favorite house in Hawaii. It was this beautiful estate overlooking the ocean. I mean, it was just straight out of a magazine and never saw the owners. And I finally asked my boss, Larry, I said, hey, what do these people do for a living? And uh, he says, they, they must be doing really. I was 20 years old. You know, I didn't know anything. And he goes, do you want what they want? I said, absolutely. That's why I'm out here in the hot sun mowing yards, going to school. And he goes, do you really want one? I said, yeah. He said, well, do yourself a favor and walk up the yard, go up the stairs and look inside the house. I said, are you crazy? He said, don't worry. They are not home. I can assure you of that. Larry had known them for a long time. So I did, as he told me, I walked up, walked up the stairs, looked in the, in the window, in the kitchen and and also the living room. And it was empty. All there was, was a couple of paper plates and, uh, and I think a roll of, uh, of paper towels. And in the corner, there was what we call a futon, which is a a bed on the, on the floor with some blankets. And I went back perplexed. I go, what gives? He goes, I mean, this beautiful house with this pool in the backyard and and a slide and all this stuff. And he says, they're broke. And I said, you, you're kidding me. He said, yeah, well, he was a uh, political uh, consultant making a lot of money. And then, and then the politician he was supporting got in trouble. And so he lost his job and his wife was an up and coming realtor and she got cancer. And so she lost her job. The problem is they spent money like they had it already. I mean, they anticipated this windfill, windfall, windfall of money and it didn't happen. And so they leveraged themselves to the tilt to buy all of the stuff, the cars, the clothes, the house. They had two mortgages, an equity line of credit. They were bankrupt basically because they couldn't afford it. And um, he said, John, you'd be surprised how many houses, these beautiful houses we work on, where these people are living paycheck to paycheck, yet you would think they're on top of the world. And that's when he said to me, he says, John, most people are, uh, are, are, all they're trying to do is keep up with the Joneses. We've all heard that term. But then he he added, he said, but the the Joneses are broke as well. And (laughs) that's when it just clicked in my head. And I thought, oh my gosh, that was, you know, I get goosebumps when I tell that story because it's, it, it really, that was the, that was the turning point for me, the transformational moment in my life where I said that will never, ever happen to me. And that's when I committed to be financially free by the time I was 40. And, and I was fortunate enough to do it based on the principles my grandparents taught me. And then that story that I had, but um, so to make a short story long, Justin, um, What's deeply meaningful to me is living life on my own terms. That's if you really boil it down, living life on my own terms, being able to do whatever I want, whenever I want it, not living, not, not working for a paycheck. And, um, and uh, like I said, just living life on my own terms. So that was a long winded answer to your question, but uh, sorry, (laughs) I have that bad habit. No, no, fascinating, fascinating story. Um, Tell me about bear traps. Oh, goodness. So, um, as you know, Robert Kiyosaki, the rich dad, poor dad uh, uh, author, um, he's a very close friend of mine. He wrote the forward for the book, and he actually inspired this book. Um, I had written a previous book, and he said, he said, John, what I really want is why the rich go broke. Because I've been telling him these alluring stories for a long time of these people, because we're both from Hawaii, and, and why the rich goes broke. And he said, that's the book that I want right now. And so, I, I, I went off and wrote this book, and 
and we were sitting in his kitchen and, um, and we were talking about why, what's the underlying reason people go broke, not just the rich, but anyone, or, or not just go broke, but why people struggle financially or live paycheck to paycheck. And I, and I, I said, really, it's people's beliefs around money. Most people have harmful beliefs around money that are stuck in their subconscious, that 95% of their subconscious, and it's built on their beliefs. And research tells us that most of our beliefs, 70% of our, 70% of our beliefs are, are destructive and self-sabotaging, and we don't know it because our subconscious is running in our background like a computer program. It's just nonstop. And there's nothing flawed with us. We just have a virus in our, in our subconscious. And so we have these negative beliefs around money. And then he said, so John, where, where, what do they do with these beliefs? And, and I, I was just kind of brainstorming in my head. And he said, well, then, then they lead to excuses. So people, you have those excuses and, or beliefs, these self-sabotaging beliefs, and then it turns into an excuse. And then from the excuse, it leads to an action, which is usually a harmful or destructive action. And then, and then in the end, there are the results of what they did, which were all based on the results. And then I'm just like, wow, bear. And then he goes, bear trap. And so that's kind of where we led to the bear trap, which starts with people's harmful beliefs. And those could be, uh, I'll never get rich. The rich are greedy. The system's rigged. It's too complicated. I'm not good with math. I need to look the part. I've got to drive a fancy car. I don't have time. That's a big one. I'm sure you've heard that one, Justin. I don't have time. Uh, I never grew up with money. Uh, it's only $50 a month on my credit card. You know, those kind of beliefs that are constantly running, uh, giving us the excuse to make bad actions or, or, or ha bad habits. And then the result is people are just living paycheck to paycheck. And so that's, that's sort of the cornerstone of what I write about in the book and, and how to overcome the bear trap, how to get out of the bear trap. So great, great. Uh, very, very useful. And I think um, examining your beliefs around money is, um, is, is hugely important. In fact, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in a little uh, kind of, uh, uh, my office is a, is, is a, is a, like a shop front town in a little um, village, uh, fishing village called Mudderford in Christchurch in Dorset, which is wow. on the south coast of the UK. And um, at the moment, I'm operating in the meeting room, doing all these kind of virtual meetings as we we're chatting today. So, yeah. um, so because we're not having anyone coming in, we're, we're doing all our all our uh, calls over over the video. And um, obviously, we've got the name of our company uh, in the window, <laughs> you know, in its MFP wealth management. And uh, sometimes, well, quite regularly, I hear people go past and they kind of look in and try to work out what you do, um, and uh, and they go and. <laughs> Lady earlier said, uh, "Oh, wealth management. Oh, we'll never go in there, then, will we?" <laughs> and and he just think, you know, and it was said to, to her child. Um, and I just thought, well, maybe you will. You know, who knows? I mean, who knows where you where? Wow. <laughs> and it's just straight away, just even just reading a sign. There's a belief, and there's a belief being passed on um, to uh, the, 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 they wouldn't be able to, to, to use our services. And, uh, and, and that may be true that they wouldn't be the right client for us at the moment, but, but yeah, it, it doesn't mean that you have to live in that world, does it? No, not at all. I mean, what a powerful and sad story to tell. I mean, that's just a perfect example of what I'm talking about. And, and what, what's interesting, I've done a lot of research in this is that, Many researchers will say that by the time you're seven years old, many of your beliefs are almost hardwired at seven. Mm. And certainly by the time you're in your mid twenties and that child that heard that, I mean, it's just getting ingrained at such an early age that they'll never be wealthy. It's almost part of their DNA that they are not going to be wealthy. And, um, and it's sad because we, we accumulate these beliefs from people that may not have our best interest at heart. And, and now with social media proliferating, as we know, basically convincing ourselves that we have to live a certain life or be a certain person or have a certain image in order to be accepted or to get likes, it either it even further compounds those negative beliefs around money and um and, and makes it even more challenging for the young, the youth, the millennials of our age 
to uh, to overcome these beliefs that are just so entrenched. So that's a powerful story. I think I'll share that one if you don't mind uh, <laughs> down the road. But yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So, um, John, um, my final question. I'm going to um, I'm I'm going to send in the mail to you uh, by FedEx, obviously, um, some a little box of magic fairy dust that you can sprinkle on anything. What what do you sprinkle it on? I'd be my dad. <laughs> my 91 my 91 year old almost 91 year old dad downstairs pixie dust or magic dust to keep him alive forever so uh that would make me happy i'm not sure that's the answer you're looking for i love but, it uh, i love it absolutely but no no i guess in a broader sense in a more global sense i would uh i'd sprinkle it on this virus to make it go away you know so we can all get back to to living our lives the way it should be and stop wearing masks and get our kids back in school and uh, get this get get this world economy up and running again because that's that's certainly what we all need yeah, so. yeah absolutely and of course um you know and it's something that i we i don't think we have time for touching on but um you know the the the, the still the the great enabler i think in the world is um entrepreneurial spirit you know the ability to to find something other people will value through it doesn't matter about your education doesn't matter about your background or your social economic group that if you can provide something to the world that is of value people will pay you for it Absolutely. and it's the fastest way to, to 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 get or the best way not some kind of tactic or bitcoin speculation or or or, or day trading or whatever the crazy thing you want to come up with now just your own entrepreneurial spirit can lift your economic um uh, means significantly and 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 change your life and change many other people's lives by providing a value to, to the benefits of the world but we do need the world to be in the in a in a place which can allow that to happen I could not agree with you more, Justin. I mean, especially when we talked about those three pillars of financial planning that are really aren't pillars anymore. They've kind of crumbled the, the the government pension, the private pension, and the personal savings. People are really going to need to be on their own to 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 financially survive in this time. Not only survive but thrive. And and having that entrepreneurial spirit is just so, so important. Finding something of value that you can offer to somebody else who would pay you for it. I think, and I, I couldn't stress that enough. Um, not even before, I mean, this was, I would be saying this before COVID, but especially now. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for joining me. It's lovely to get to know you. Um, where can poor people find about you, the great work, your your Thrive course and your books, et cetera? Where do, where do we uh, where, where can people find out more about where you are? Thanks, Justin. Probably the best way is just to go to my website. It's uh, John MacGregor, um, M-A-C-G-R-E-G-O-R. As we said earlier, I'm Scottish, not Irish. Uh, so John McGregor.net. And um, so I've got videos and my book, as well as a lot of free resources that people can download for free and start really start their journey to financial freedom immediately um, and get their financial house in order. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and once again, thanks for your time. My pleasure. Really, really great seeing you, Justin. Thank you so much. And I love the work you're doing. All the best. Thanks, John. Thanks once again to John for joining me today. To find out more about John and the, his books, including the top 10 reasons the rich go broke, check out the show notes on our website at theretirementcafe.co.uk, where you will find all those useful links. As ever, if you've enjoyed this episode, please do leave us a review on Apple Podcasts to help us reach like-minded people. And be sure to subscribe either on our website or your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. Thank you once again to the Joy Club for sponsoring the podcast. To find out more about how the Joy Club can help you enjoy a more active, connected and joyful retirement, check out the show notes where you'll find details of their exclusive offer just for you. Listeners to the Retirement Cafe podcast get three months free premium membership to the Joy Club. So until next time, this is Justin King helping you feel more informed in your retirement.